Welcome to Becoming Church, the podcast where we discuss how the message and movement of Jesus is not just about becoming Christians, but about becoming the church. I'm your host, Kristen Mockler Young, and I'm so glad you are joining the conversation. Welcome back to Becoming Church. Listen, today you need to buckle up because we are going outside of the Christian church. And I'm not honestly even sure where we're going to end up. We may end up with the Jehovah's Witnesses, maybe a Hindu temple, maybe even the Church of Scientology, because my guest today covers them all. I'm happy to introduce you to Jeremy Jenkins from All Things, All People. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Christian, thank you so much for having me. That is a tremendous introduction and even I sometimes like when I hear that even those types of things even I get a little nervous so so yeah but I'm excited to have a conversation with you well good I'm going to tell you this is going to be a conversation like no other that has ever been had on this podcast because I think it's a place that a lot of people are afraid to go to honestly little like 10 year old Christian you know traditional like Kristen inside of me is scared they're like why are you Mm -hmm. doing what are you going in this conversation so yeah before we get there, give us some background into all things, all people. Yeah. Well, so all things, all people, and um, we affectionately just call it ATAP, just okay. sim- simplify it. So feel free. But um, so we, um, I think we started in 2019 um, and it originally had just started. Um, I, I'm fascinated with world religions um, and I grew up um, in Wheaton, Illinois, right out outside Chicago. And my family um, was not Christian. And so I, even after I became a believer, my freshman year high school, I was, I was fascinated by um, other things, other groups, religions, cults, and um, they're in like a metropolitan area like like Chicago, and even more so, you know, you're beginning to see it more and more in places even like where, where you're located, and I'm not far off in Charlotte, you know, it's like, I would just see places, I would see temples, I would see, you know, other churches that I didn't understand, like what makes them different from us and things like that. And so from an early age, it had always been, you know, um, somewhat fascinating to me. But, uh, but basically, the last few years, we've spent time uh, and energy researching. Um, I'm a I'm a pastor uh, here in uh, Forest City, North Carolina, and then I also am a college professor. I teach uh, world religions as, as an adjunct at Gardner Webb University, and so and then also with everything I do with ATAP, I I'm constantly researching other world religions, other worldviews, cults, and then as I'm sure you know, I, I know we're going to get into, we actually go and see these things for ourselves. I I think it's. I think it's pretty uh one thing that's lost from the from the modern day Western church is uh an appetite for exploration and the idea that like, well, I can just read a Wikipedia page or I can listen to a podcast or I can watch a documentary yeah. and I can get everything I need. And in all honesty, like I don't endorse everybody doing what I do, or or even sure. most people. But I think it's important for 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 Christians to every once in a while and say, be able to say, Hey, we've actually seen this. We we've actually talked to these people. Like, like I just, and I, and I think I owe it to a Latter-day Saint, a Jehovah's witness, a a Hindu, a Muslim to when I'm engaging with them, hoping to be able to pray with them, share the gospel with them, maybe even lead them to, to know Christ as their Lord. I think I owe it to them to not have allowed my entire opinion about what Mm. they believe in their worldview to be shaped by a book or a documentary. I think I should allow them to shape it, you know, tell you, tell me what you believe, not Wikipedia or a documentary I I watch on Netflix. And now I think I'm an expert. And so, so yeah, we do a whole, a whole course of things, um, podcasting and writing and all sorts of different stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how we, that's how we got there. I love that idea of, I mean, you're just, it's such a beautiful picture of going, Hey, I'm going to recognize the Imago Dei in every single person. And I think a lot of times Christians, get that concept, but we're like, but we only see God in people who like our God, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and who, and so just, it sounds like your heart behind this is really just understanding the humanity of every single person. And even people that maybe don't even realize yet how God is working in their life, that you see God in them. And I just think that's such a beautiful thing. So I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's in my, in my opinion, you know, if you, if you spend even just 
a little bit of time studying religions, you'll find that. Um, so, so, and I feel like I always have to throw this out there. Like I, I, I do believe in exclusivism. Like I do believe Christ is the only way to yeah. salvation and all those things. But what I will say is that what I've found is that God has been working in and through history and in the world in such a way that a, a lot of these false religions, um, you know, like pretty much every, every religion doesn't matter. They have some sort of belief in angels and demons, and they have some sort of belief in some sense of morality. And what we can see in them is that humanity since the beginning of time has been struggling, like Paul says at the Areopagus in Acts 17, he says, it seems as if you have been groping for God. Mm. And um, in, 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 in then so much so that they made this temple to the unknown God. And then Paul says, hey, I know, I know the God you've been searching for. And I think sometimes with apologetics and evangelism, we treat non-believers as adversaries. And Paul yeah once again says, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle yeah. against, you know, demons and principalities and powers and darkness. And, and so that's kind of how I've approached things, which is not that, hey, there's truth to be found in all these religions. I, I would never say that. But what I find is that the, the drawing and the yearning of the heart of a Muslim to draw near to God or a Hindu to draw near to God or somebody in a cult is it's the same. It's the same yearning that drew you and I to Christ. And that we need to help them understand that, hey, what you're what you're seeking will never be found in these other things. And so, uh, so yeah, so it's it's um, it 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 might not be a different approach. I, I'm, a lot of men and women throughout Christian history have have approached it far better than I have. I'm not a very good evangelist. Um, I'm I'm a much better teacher than I'm evangelist. But um, but at the same time, unfortunately, in our in our neck of the woods in Christianity, we've sort of lost the ability to treat to not treat non-believers as adversaries and, yeah. and to help them understand, Hey, what you're looking for is uh, you are able to find it, but you're looking in the wrong place. Yeah. Or you're, you're, you're just a little bit off, a little bit misguided. Yeah. It's so sure. funny too, because I think evangelism, like, Oh my gosh, I just think of being out on the college quad and evangelizing and how, even as I was doing it, I was like, this is weird and not right. But, <laughs> mm. but I was like, this is what we were told to do the way we were doing it. But I think you're right. I think a lot of Christians have evangelism as like, we need to go out and find the people that are wrong and convince them that what's right. Yeah. Instead of, again, coming back to your heart of this, of like understanding people and it, right from your website, it says ATAP exists to explore the darkest places and worldviews and to equip Christians to engage with them with the, with the gospel. And it's like, well, you're not going to be able to engage anybody that you're holding yeah. at arm's length. Yeah. So we have to be able to understand them. We have to be able to say like, Hey, even though we don't agree, I'm not coming to attack you with Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to understand you so that then we can have a conversation. Absolutely. I feel like this would be lonely work for you though. Like into mm -hmm. a lot of people, our pastor name, uh, yeah. is an ex Muslim Muslim. Yeah. He always gets at me for how Muslim. I say that word. Yes. Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so he has been able to speak into, um, a lot of different world religions, right? And mm -hmm. I think there are people that will venture into that, will teach that, will kind of put that side by side with Christianity, but you take it even farther into some quote unquote dark corners. I feel like this is something that would be, that there's not a lot of people out there doing that. Is that true? No, no, yeah. no. no. <laughs> yeah. no. And sometimes <laughs> I wonder, so sometimes I, the insecurity for me comes when I, when I think about that and I kind of go, well, am I doing something wrong? You know, mm -hmm. but I, I, it is, it can, can be lonely work. Now I'll tell you, so we had a, we had a banquet, um, kind of a fundraiser banquet for some of our supporters locally a few weeks ago. And I, and I just gave a short little speech thanking people who've gotten us as where we are. And I said, you know, God made me to do this. And I, it, weirdly enough, Kristen, like, so I'm a firm believer in spiritual warfare and, yeah. um, and, and the things that come with that. And, yeah. but it is a weird thing up until this point, the Lord has protected me greatly from many of the things that I've seen other people, missionaries, especially uh, experience. And then the Lord gave me the right wife and he gave me the right friends and he gave, gave me the right church. Like I, I can't even really explain that fully because a lot of times, like if you follow uh, ATEP on social media, I, I very rarely, if ever, I don't think I've ever gone into one of these situations by myself. I always have somebody with me. And it's usually one of my friends who some of them are on our board. Some of them are just friends of mine. Some of them are guys I pastor with. Some of them are you know, guys who just, we've gotten to the point now where people are like, Hey, I want to go on one of these things with you. Sure. And we're, we're pretty careful about that. But, um, 
And, and so the Lord, the Lord surrounded me with the right community. And then I come home to a wife who she grew up really traditional Baptist. Mm -hmm. Um, I did not, I grew up, uh, you know, I didn't get saved until I was a freshman in high school. And I, and I, I got saved into a, um, an ELCA Lutheran church, which is like the most liberal denomination <laughs> okay. in the West now. And, um, and I don't subscribe to those beliefs by any means anymore, but, but I, I, uh, I, I married my wife, Courtney, and she, um, man, you know, I come home and sometimes she jokes, she's like, do I need to spray you with holy water? Um, <laughs> And, you know, but we have, you know, the, the, but other than the grace of God, just purely pushing and pulling us and protecting us, we also have a, a team of people and supporters who, you know, when we're doing some of the weirder stuff that we do, um, we, we make sure to let people know, oh, Hey, can you please pray for us? And we have this, we have this social media following of these people who not just like are weirdly fascinated with this stuff, but they also many, if not most of them. Um, are fervent intercessors in supporting us. And so, mm. so it, it, up to this point, it, it has not been so lonely or damaging that I've ever thought about stopping it. Um, and so if anything, it's only served as a confirmation that, uh, you know, we're, we're doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, and that your work is important and it matters sure. and that, you know, God did call mm. you and equip you to yeah. do this. I think there's definitely something to having, you know, a healthy understanding and acceptance of darkness or spiritual warfare or whatever mm. you want to call it. <laughs> But why do you think so many people are afraid to honestly even like acknowledge that it exists, let alone discuss it or want to learn more about it? Yeah. So I, I, I had the opportunity to speak to a, a fellow academic and his, his uh, academic pedigree far goes beyond mine. His name is Dr. Travis Kearns, and he used to be at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He, he had planted um, a church in uh, either Salt Lake or Provo, Utah. And so he had ministered, he, he's in my opinion, the foremost evangelical scholar on the Latter-day Saints. And I asked him that question because, you know, I was like, Dr. Kearns, like there's, there's like me and you and like four other people, you know, who, who are in the evangelical sphere who are really, really engaged with this stuff. Why is that? And he just said, Jeremy, because it's weird. Like people yeah. don't like weird things. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, people, like I said, people will read a book, they'll, they'll watch a documentary, but when it comes to running parallel to something, bumping up against something. Um, and like I said, I don't endorse people going to Hindu temples and all those things, like unless, unless they're, they're called to, they feel compelled to, but, but it, it's weird. But at the end yeah. of the day, we, we sometimes forget, like I live in a small town, you live in a, in a big city. We're really close mm -hmm. to each other. But like, at the end of the day, like I can leave my my office right now. And, and I, because I know where they are, I could find you 10 South Asians in my little mm -hmm. tiny podunk North Carolina town. And I actually go to your neck of the woods, like when to get content, you know what I mean? Yeah. You've probably seen yeah. the stuff I post. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I could, like, you probably could, could walk maybe or, or, or get an Uber really cheap to some of the places that I've been. So what people don't realize is yes, it's weird. Yes. It's strange. It doesn't feel, it feels strange. Like it, 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 it and it does because it's a, a really a very real spiritual reality that sometimes we ignore that there is like in Daniel when he's fasting and praying and the angel shows up and says, Hey, there, there, there's a war in the heavenlies. Yeah. And I tried to get here quicker, but I, yeah. I couldn't because I was contending against the prince of the air that's yeah. happening all around us. And so, but the, but the, what people need to realize is it's happening all around us and it's not hard to find, you know, you and I are in the, in the Bible belt and I think sometimes Christians have been tricked into thinking, well, I don't need to learn about this stuff. I don't need to become sharpened or equipped with this stuff because it's not around me, but it is. And it's becoming more and more around me, not just because of um, not just because of people from the other parts of the world coming here. Sometimes we call them world religions and we think that Christianity isn't a world religion. But right. um, but the reality, too, is um, the West is changing, like what used to be a purely and I shouldn't even say that, but a Christian, you know, purely Christian nation sure. is becoming less and less of that. And the Bible belt is becoming less and less of that. And so, so yeah. And then the other thing I would say, the reason why people don't engage with it or even realize or recognize that it exists is because they don't know what to do with it. You know, we saw, um, I'm 34. And so I grew up in the midst of the Harry Potter, uh, craziness, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody was trying to figure out is Harry Potter good or bad. Right. And, you know, I won't necessarily speak to that because I don't want, you know, <laughs> half of your, your listener base to hate me and the other half to love me. But, um, but at the end of the day, we see a really shallow level of engagement with, uh, counter worldviews. Meaning if it seems like if it, if it seems bad, 
then I'm just going to never, ever look at it ever again. And in, in, in all honesty, Christian, a lot of that comes from an insecurity that if I really engaged with that topic, what maybe it's my, my Latter-day Saint coworker, or if it's a, a Hindu neighbor or something like that, if I really engaged with that person so that I could maybe introduce them to Christ, how on earth am I going to answer the inevitable questions that they have for me? Or maybe they, maybe they just hate me because of it. And I don't know how to handle that. And so what we do is we, we kind of put our head in the sand and we play ignorant to what's happening all around us. Mm. And so you have this very real, absolutely. It's so much easier. It's so much easier to never share your faith or even uh, to engage with counter worldviews and pretend like they're not there. So you have this very real spiritual battle that's weird and unsettling. And then you have uh, uh, really a, a church in the West um, that, you know, we're just dramatically ill-equipped. And part of that is because we just, uh, you know, we'd rather, we'd rather not, you know, we, and, 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 and instead we turn all of our attention to, to other things, some of which are worthwhile, but some of which are just really um, uh, kind of wasted not, of time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and speak to me too about, I think there's a lot of fear and I, I think we probably grew up in like this similar eras where the more I look back, the more I realize there was really an underlying fear, even with Harry Potter, even with that example. And so here you are, you're going to like Wiccan gatherings. I don't even know what they're called. And you're going into cults and you're going into things where I feel like Christians or people would say like, that is of the devil. Like that is yep. Satan. And you are going into this evil. And I think that there's a lot of fear of if I like, Oh my gosh, because I just said Satan, like now he's going to be here trying to overtake my yeah. spirit, you know, and spiritual mm-hmm. warfare is weird and it's real, mm-hmm. but how do we speak to the fear of it too? Like, obviously you're doing this work. I don't think yeah. that you're a Satan worshiper now because you've no. gone into these spaces, you know? <laughs> no. So, yeah, I mean, um, you know, and, and I'll say this too, uh, you know, I think I, I can speak for myself and myself alone. You know, we, we, I put up really healthy boundaries. Like, so what I think or healthy boundaries, at least, you know, and, and, and I have accountability. So like, for those who are listening, who aren't familiar with what, what ATAP does, like, I don't, you know, especially with, when it comes to like witchcraft, Wicca, like I don't go and participate in anything. I might, I go more as an anthropologist. So like I, I studied inter, intercultural studies in my, at the master's level. And that's really just the Christian way of saying anthropology. And like, <laughs> um, and so, so like I go as an observer and when I, and when I get the opportunities, I, 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 I would, I would do my best to share the gospel if, if at all possible. So all that to say, um, the reason why we're afraid, or maybe the reason why we shouldn't be afraid yes, is if I really believe the things that the Bible says about Jesus and the things that I say about Jesus, then why would I be afraid of these other powers of the air and of darkness? Now they can hurt me. I mean, certainly sure. like they can, they can hurt me. They can scare me. They can intimidate me. Um, they can, they can do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, if we believe what historically the church has said about eternity and salvation and justification and the healing that is in Christ and the protection that is in Christ and the Holy Spirit, then ultimately, even if it kills me, it can't kill me. And, and, and so, so now that, that might seem, you know, uh, you know, like a, a, a machismo or a boldness or something like that. But at the end of the day, it really is just just belief in what the Bible says to be true, yeah. which is, you know, like Paul said, we, we don't contend against uh, things of this world. And, and, and so the things that we're, the things that we're mostly scared of, um, we don't need to be scared of now. Now we can't be reckless, you know, we can't right. be foolish. Right. And, right. and I see that sometimes too, but, um, and we, we, we fervently strive to not be foolish or reckless or flippant, but at the end of the day, people being f- fearful of those things or, or, or not wanting to be reckless has actually led to an apathy that has just caused us to really do nothing. And so I, I don't think people should be afraid. I, I think people should be cautious. I think people should be wise, but they shouldn't be afraid. Mm, that's good. Well, and fear really is, I think, the very first tactic of the enemy, you know, yeah, absolutely. to keep us from anything that we're supposed to do, whether it's talking to, you know, a neighbor of a different belief or just talking to a neighbor in general, because yeah. we've become so isolated and so, you know, into our own selves, which is a whole Absolutely. conversation that I'm not going to take us down yeah. that rabbit hole right now. Sure. Yeah. 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 So how does ATAP work? Do you like when you go into a group, 
like, let's say you're going to, uh, you know, on one of your field trips, as I'm sure you don't mm-hmm. call them, yeah. but that's what it is in my brain. Okay, like, I kind of like it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you go in undercover? Do you like let your pastor freak flag fly so people know who you are? Like, how does this work? So, I mean, it, it, so I'll say this. We never lie. Okay. I, I never lie. Right. So um, it depends. Right. So like we just last year, we we went uh, uh, one of one of my friends and I who actually serves as kind of our lead photographer and videographer. He and I went to Utah for the Latter-day Saints General Conference. So there's 13,000 Latter-day Saints all streaming into this conference center. And we're there with a camera, you know, yeah. and we're trying to talk to people. They're, they're, they're kind of closed off to us because unfortunately what we discovered when we got there was there's this whole street full of quote unquote Christian protesters. Yeah. And, the, and it's kind of not Westboro Baptist per se, but oh. kind of in that same vein. And so we're sort of they're stuck, stuck in this chasm now between being identified with them. So nobody sure. was talking to us. So we actually sure. ended up spending most of our time talking to the protesters. But but anyway, um, you know, uh, in, in some situations, we are just like completely open. Like, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I just we, I want to learn more about this and we want to learn it from you. And mm-hmm. so you and then the other thing, you know, when you're really honest and you're not trying to be dishonest, like people are a little bit more open. Now, I, we don't always say, you know, I don't, I, I don't say, Hey, I'm the executive director of all things, all people. And we go into the darkest places, you know, all those things, because you don't want right. to offend people. I, I oftentimes will tell people I'm a professor. You'd be surprised. Like when somebody finds out you're a professor, a teacher, the defenses go, go way down. Sure. And so we, we intentionally don't lie. And we also don't like, we don't record people unknowingly. Like, yeah. um, we don't do anything kind of shady like that. And and we've even told people, like we've said, hey, like I'm a Christian pastor. I don't agree with you, right? But I want to hear it from you. And so yeah. now, now sometimes it's as simple as like we go into like Charlotte or Asheville, which I know you're you're, you're very familiar with Charlotte. I'm sure you're very familiar with Asheville too. Like um, it, we we'll, we'll go into places like a shop and there's tons of like witchcraft and new age shops in Asheville. Mm -hmm. And we might not talk to anybody. We might just go in and just observe. And if nobody talks to us, we might not talk to anybody because it's, it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, Hey, this is a public place. We're not going into a temple or something like that. So, but, um, but yeah, it kind of, it depends, but I've always been intentional. Like we don't ever want to lie. We don't ever want to mislead people. Um, and uh, and we try and do our best to to honor the dignity of that person or people that we're that we're documenting. Yeah, that's good. That's really great. I mean, there's just a lot of humility in that. Again, back to like what I said at the beginning, it just feels like you're really honoring people. Well, like I think Jesus would have done. So that's awesome, Jeremy. Is there something that you have learned along the way, either like a really cool experience or like mm-hmm. a really interesting thing, like what has stuck out to you? So. It, it's amazing. Like I'm really b- blessed to have had a lot of really cool experiences. And, you know, if somebody goes on our social media or, or our website, they'll see evidence of that. And, and we find ourselves in really weird places. We were just in, we were just in India and in Varanasi, which is where wow. they, um, which is like, I don't know, I, I won't go in at length, but it's a pretty dark place where there's a lot of death and there's a lot of death ritual and things like that. Mm-hmm. But what's what I think probably what's been most impressed upon me over the last few years, you know, I mentioned my age and I mentioned, you know, I'm a millennial and I grew up and I went to, I went to Christian undergrad, I went to Christian schools for both my bachelor's and my master's. And I think the thing that I've learned going and seeing this stuff for myself is that growing up, I was, I was taught and I was encouraged to be aware of what we, what we used to call new atheism, which is like, I was sort of raised in this evangelical sphere to believe that guys like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, um, were the great antagonists of the church that these, that this materialist atheist was the worldview that we would have to contend with for, for our entire lives. And what I've learned Christian is that there are very few atheists in this world. Um, and even some of the people who say they're atheists are not atheists. And if they are atheists, they're not materialist and a materialist being that they believe that this whole world is just physical. Like they, they, they yeah. wouldn't believe in some spiritual aspect. Um, I think the thing that probably has pushed me over more is that, especially among a younger demographic, um, the millennials and Gen Z's is, is most of them are what I would call spiritual agnostic. 
demographics is okay. that they're very disenfranchised with the institutionalized church. And they have, instead of turning to atheism, which is what I was kind of told they would do, is instead they've turned towards this idea of being extremely open-minded and extremely oriented towards there is a spiritual realm, there is a spiritual world, this world is not just physical, but you can sort of kind of golden cor corral your way through it. Like, yeah. of like it, crystals <laughs> work for me or, Hey, I, you yeah. know, and, and I'm sure you've dealt with this, like, man, being at a place like North Carolina, I don't meet anybody who doesn't say they're a Christian. You know what I mean? It's like, everybody's <laughs> a Christian. And then you find out some of the things they believe you go, no, there's no way you can right. classify that as Christianity. But so, so that's probably been the biggest thing that I've, I've taken away is going to all these places is I've, I've I don't think I've met a, a, a like what I thought an atheist would be. Okay. Um, I meet, I meet plenty of people who say, I'm, I don't believe in God. And then you find out that they believe in ghosts or they believe in Ouija boards or they believe in an afterlife or they believe in reincarnation. I go, okay, so you might not believe in Yahweh, yeah. but you believe in something. Yeah. And so that was probably the biggest thing for me is coming out of school and going, man, I, I'm going to have to spend my life debating people like Richard Hawkins, Richard Dawkins. I'm not, I've never debated anybody, you yeah. know what I mean? And I'm not necessarily looking to do that. So, um, so th that was probably my biggest takeaway doing this okay. is, uh, is we, we might've been led astray in what we were prepared for all those years. Yeah. So when you're going in and you're having these conversations, right. With people mm -hmm. that like, let's say you were going prepared, you know, to argue the atheist, but instead you're having conversations with people who are open to all kinds of things. Do you feel like you have like kind of a set list of talking points or do you just kind of rely on the Holy Spirit just to kind of lead the conversation? Like, yeah. how do you know what to say? So, so in all honesty, so I work with some people and I know some people who are really good evangelists. And I'm just not a really good evangelist. Like I'm, I'm really good at talking, but I'm not a good evangelist. <laughs> so I completely rely on, uh, I guess, I guess the Holy Spirit, you would say, I mean, I, I don't want to be so humble and, and holy that, that I, I rely on my ineptitude, which makes me ask them what, so what is it that you believe? Oftentimes, uh, and I don't say this like boastfully, I mean, we are all blissfully unaware, like most of our church, right? So like, you know, you work at Mosaic, I'm at Element Church in Fort City. We we have to admit that most of the people in our churches don't know as much about Christianity as we probably think they do. Sure. And so oftentimes when I'm talking to a Latter-day Saint or a Hindu or somebody who professes belief in some new age belief, I know more than them about that belief. But instead of kind of acting that way, I'll say, tell me what you believe. Mm -hmm. And and I just try my best to listen. And I'm And I'm not tremendous at that, you know, but like trying my best to listen and then ask questions that could potentially lead back towards me being able to say, can I tell you what I believe? Yeah. And so, so yeah, I don't have a, a set list. Um, I mean, I have some things I'm sure that kind of have just become habit for me of yeah. questions that I ask. And um, people ask me all the time, like, you know, how, how what's the best way to share your faith with Latter-day Saint? What's the best way to share your faith with the Jehovah's Witness and the list goes on. And I usually tell people, I go, you know, I'll work on having, I'll work on figuring out a way to tell you, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm, that's not really my forte. Like it's so, it's such a labor of love for me to do that. But yeah, so I, I if I tried to go in with a set list, I would probably sound like a bumbling idiot. So I do my best to listen. <laughs> I do my best to listen and engage with what that person says. Um, yeah. and then, and try and ask good questions. Like, um, you know, so like, you, you know, you're a podcaster, I'm a podcaster. Like I learned early on doing interviews that you're only as interesting as you are interested. And, and the same holds true for these types of things that, you know, anybody's doing, but especially if you're talking to somebody who views and interprets the world completely different, if I'm interested in them, yeah. I think there's a really good chance that they might be interested in me. Um, and so that's just kind of what I try and go about doing. Yeah, man, that's your pull quote. And we could really use that for any topic. Like, this is what I just want to just make a new Christian bumper sticker. Yeah. That's just like, hey, listen and ask questions. Yeah. Stop mm -hmm. talking, listen and ask questions because yeah. then you're going to know how to engage people and they will engage you back because they don't feel like they're being lectured. That's just, yeah, yeah, that's. So great. Yes. I'm going to like shout that from the rooftops. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, without telling people that they need to go check out a cult because yeah, most of our don't. listeners are like, yep, can't do anything with this episode. No, what yeah, are some no. practical ways that people can be light in the darkness, right? Exactly where yeah. they are right now. Um, two that come to my mind. 
okay. is just simple, simple. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll preface it with, hey, pray, be, you know, be yeah. a person of prayer, all the things that we're going to encourage, right? So, but um, talk about your faith. Like, just like, like, uh, I actually posted something on Instagram today. I had, I had heard this podcast. It's like, like these two military guys talking, right? And, and one of them was a believer and one of them wasn't. And a friend of mine who had listened to the same podcast said, man, he's talking to him as if he's a Christian too. Like he's talking to him as if he understands what he's saying. And I realized, I was like, man, we all talk about our faith to non-believers as if we have to apologize for it. And like, we sort mm-hmm. of say like, hey, hey I, I believe in the Bible and I know that sounds crazy, but let me tell you this, uh, this is kind of why I believe that and this and this, instead of just saying like, hey, Christ is my Lord. And then you move on, right? And, it, and, and chances are that person, if they're interested, because you didn't over explain or hyper rationalize something, they're going to go, what do you mean when you say Christ is Lord? And it's like, oh, boom, right there. So, so talk about your faith. Don't be ashamed. Don't turn a poly- like, don't, don't turn apologetics into apologizing, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, then the second thing, and this is something um, I, I challenged my church to do this year. And, and I'm uh, actually, I need to get better at it. Carry, carry your, your Bible around, like get a thin line Bible. And um, you know, you and I are on social media a lot. So this is probably a word for you and I, when you sit down at the DMV, when you are waiting to go into the doctor's office, when you are, you know, whatever, instead of scrolling through Instagram, just open your Bible, like open that little new Testament and just read it because, because really a lot of the insecurity that I find that people have, and that I have with, I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know how to answer people's questions at the, at the diagnostic level, what they're really saying, and they don't realize it is I have not hidden the word in my heart. Like I, I want the Holy spirit to use me, but you know, and I'm not putting limits on the Holy spirit, but it's, it's difficult to get water out of an empty well. And so yeah. we need to internalize, internalize the word, like hide it within our hearts, make it part. Like I can, you know, why is it that I can tell you the lyrics from every song that I've listened to in the last 10 days, but I can't quote scripture as easy as I can quote, you know, whatever m- musician I like at the time. And yeah. so, so that, and then the other thing too, is, is once again, you're bringing your faith into the public sphere. And, and I think as Americans, being influenced by um, worldviews that tell us that religion and the public sphere should be separate. We have hidden our faith from people. And I don't know if it's out of fear. I don't know if it's out of an attempt to not offend people. Um, but at the end of the day, what we've done is we've made, we, we've, we've, we've made two kingdoms. We've made the public kingdom, which is dominated by politics and secular worldviews. And then we've had our faith, which happens at home or in churches. And when we bring our faith into the public sphere, not in a domineering way, like you and I've said, like not in a domineering or, or yeah. uh, whatever kind of way, it, just in a simple, humble way of saying like, when somebody says, Hey, what are you reading? And you're just yeah. like, Oh man, I'm reading the word of God. And once again, defaulting back to that, that, that priest, that idea that I'm not going to try and apologize or explain away why I'm being sure. a Christian in the public sphere. I'm going to say, Oh, I'm reading the word of God. Um, and, and when somebody goes, what do you, you know, what do you mean the word of God? And you can say, well, let me tell you what I mean by the sure. word of God. And so, so those two things I think are just simple, kind of like not, you have to go to school, not you have to follow somebody on social media so that they can coach you through it or something like yeah. that. Um, it, it's, or even, you know, you don't even need to be gifted. You know, you just need to be, you, you know I mean? You just need to be a Christian. And I actually saw something. I like something that you posted the other day, like, um, and, and I'm going to mess it up, but you said, let's not be Christians. Let's be Christ followers, I think, or something yeah, like let's, that. Let's stop being be, Christians. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like, let's be the of course, yeah. that was a great job that stopped the scroll because I was like, wait, hold on. You know, like, so, so yeah. but I, I resonate, <laughs> I resonate with that of like, Hey, let's, um, let's live a, it's like you leave a ball of dough on, on the counter in the morning. Um, and you come back and, and it's risen. It's just, that's going to happen. Like there's nothing you can do to stop it. And it's like, that's kind of what the church is supposed to be in the public yeah. sphere. Yeah. And so, so yeah. And so those are the two things that I would say, don't just inject your faith into, into your speech unapologetically, um, and then bring the Bible into the public sphere and in, in, insert that, whatever it might be, listen to worship sure. music in the public sphere, sure. whatever it might right. be, right, right, right. Um, but don't be private. Yeah. And I was going to say too, for some people that seems like, that sounds like a massive jump. They're like, take my Bible into public. Yeah. It can be as simple as, you know, baby steps, work your way yeah. up. Right. Like you said, mm-hmm. sharing 
I mean, for some people, I think a, a big courageous first step is even like if they follow their own church or a pastor or somebody they like, it could just be sharing yeah. that to their own feed on social media. Mm. And that could be your big first step where people all of a sudden are like, wait, what? Yes. I didn't know okay. that you went to church or I didn't know that you believed that. And that I like that. Yeah. First. Yeah. You're absolutely right. In all honesty, you know? sometimes like I think I don't know how it is at Mosaic, but like for me, I. Yeah, I like that because it, you're right. I mean, it is one of those things where some people have almost been like closeted with their faith yeah. to, to the nth degree where they're saying, man, if I start carrying around my Bible around, people are going to be like, well, you're a Christian. You right. know? Like, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, no, but whatever, insert there, yeah. right? The idea of bring your faith into, yeah. into the public sphere, into your relationships, all of them, you know, yeah. even, you know, your non-believing friends who, you right. know, do not like Christian, but they like you. Like right. that's the amazing thing. They don't like Christianity, but they like you. Yeah. And they're going to actually like you more and more because as Christ mm -hmm. changes you. And so, yeah. So I like that a lot that what you just yeah. said, interjected. And I mean, it's, it's in, in, even as easy as like, you know, coworker on a Monday morning, like, Hey, how's your weekend? What'd you do? Did this Friday, did this Saturday, went to church Sunday, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like you said, move on. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like outline yeah. the sermon for them, but it's just yeah. that little mm -hmm. drops here and there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the last question that I typically ask everybody, because, and it very much goes back to what we just talked about, you know, this, the whole idea of this podcast is that we don't believe that we're meant to be just Christians and just carry yeah. this label of Christians. We're supposed to become the church, but I want to tweak it for you just a little bit and give you kind of a two part, um, because you are a pastor and then also you've been in like every church imaginable. So kind of my sure. two part question for you is what's something that you've seen Christians do where they think they're being the church, but it's not actually attracting people in. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, what's something that you've seen people do that is working? Yeah. Um, so in regards to the first one, um, I, I think, and man, you know, I, I don't know if it's because I'm a pastor or what, but I'm just like, I never want to beat up on the church for just trying their best, you know, yeah. but I think, and I know you don't either, but I think, trying to be so much like the culture around them that honestly, I mean, if we're talking about non-believers coming in, I think a lot of times non-believers come in and they're like, so really this is just a concert and a Ted talk. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and, yeah. and, 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 and we have to inject, like, it's, it's perfectly fine to contextualize. Like I, I don't, lights fog do whatever you want to do like yeah. like we have so much grace in that yeah. but at the end of the day if you have stripped away the sacred um the in favor of you know whatever it is that's popular at the moment then i think you might attract big numbers mm -hmm. but attracting unto what and actually i can't believe i'm going to reference this guy but um shia labeouf did uh a <laughs> did, did a uh a podcast with a guy named Bishop Barron, who's a really popular um, social media, he's a Catholic bishop. And, and he actually said something that I thought was profound. He, he said that when he goes to the Latin mass, which, which now I'll say this, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not endorsing Catholic theology by any means, but he said, when I go to the Latin mass, I feel like I'm being let in on something. Hmm. And I was like, hmm, okay. Like, and it goes back to, is our faith worth sharing? Yeah. And so just, I think we, pastors, ministers, leaders, Christians in general, like we need to ask ourselves, Am I inviting someone to a show or am I inviting to, them to something sacred yeah. and something special? And so I something think, yeah, different. just, yeah. yeah, something different, something they can't get anywhere else, right. you know, and it's not, not coming to the building that they can't get it, but it's the church. Right? right. So that's, so that's the one thing I think, and that's a, that's a big thing, of course, and that that'll look different in every culture and in every sure. age. The thing that I've seen people like the church do well, and especially recently is I'm a man, I, I get emotional talking about him. Uh, and, and unfortunately, he and I've never interacted. I've tried to get him on podcasts for years and years and years. But Tim Keller shaped my faith in, in such a huge way, like reading his books and listening to his sermons. And then he blew me away when I found out that when he was the pastor at Redeemer um, in New York City, that, and I think he did it right up until he left, like most Sundays or every other Sunday, something like that, he would do Q&A after, after the service. Mm -hmm. And um, I've tried to do, I've tried to model my, my ministry life after that, because I've had so many people come up to me and I had somebody come up to me yesterday and say, Hey, I don't think I would be where I'm at if I wasn't in your small group 
when I became a Christian because you were the first person. I don't say this boisterous because because like sure. it's just any of us can do this, but you were the first person that I felt didn't mind that I was asking questions and that I was questioning my faith. And so I think, and I don't know, I mean, sometimes it's just like, you have to be the right person to do that. But at the end of the day, I think we can all band around the idea that if we're going to be hugely invitational to Christianity, which we should be, yeah. then we need to not only be prepared to answer questions and address questions, but we also have to be okay when people ask and we have to yeah. give them spheres to ask questions. And even if that's like, even if you're the person that's like, man, just like how I'm saying, I'm not a good evangelist. Maybe you're not a good teacher. Maybe you're not a good uh, question answerer, but like every church should have a pastor or, or a lay person who's just like, man, Hey, if they have really tough questions, I want to, I want to help them with that. Yeah. And I think we've seen through ministries like, and I referenced Keller, but you know, people like that, we've seen so many people who not only have come to faith, but they came to faith surprisingly. And they've said, I've never, I've, I've never, you know, Hey, I left my youth group when I was 14 because my youth pastor, and my parents made me feel bad for asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. And you actually seemed like you enjoyed it. And it's like, yeah, like that, that's what, that's what we should be doing. So I don't know. I mean, every church in the world is going to do that differently. Every sure. small group is going to do that. Every pastor is going to do that differently. But I think we have to have a heart for questions and we have to have a heart for understanding that if people are coming in, um, they're bringing something with them right. and we have to be okay with saying, you know, not affirming everything by any means, but being able to say, Hey, I, I will walk with you yes, as exactly. the Holy spirit leads you. And I will help my, I will do my best to, to, you know, help light the path with the life yeah. that I have. So that's, yeah. that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Well, it goes back to the same idea of listening to other mm -hmm. people and engaging with them. You know, we've said, we don't do Q and a on Sunday morning, like, yeah from the stage at Mosaic, but we have very much become a place where not only are we comfortable with questions, but we tell people, you know, flat out, like mm -hmm. number one, you can ask us, you can have your questions here. You can have your doubts here. You can come when you don't even believe what we believe, but beyond that also, we're not even promising you answers. <laughs> like yeah, if you're no. okay asking questions and we don't necessarily have an answer to give you, but like, if you're willing to be here, we will sit in it with you. We will wrestle mm -hmm. through it with you. We will walk forward towards God with you. And I think mm -hmm. people just, like you said, they just need a safe place to go. I'm not sure. And if it's okay that I'm not sure, and I can yeah. just figure it out here, then really like, sure. That's what the church should be, you know? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know is a complete sentence, right. you know? Um, but I think, um, a, I just think a lot of people view Christians and right so because we've turned apologetics into like watch this atheist get owned by a christian right. apologist right on a, you know a clickbait on youtube but um but i you know peter said you know be ready to give a valid defense mm -hmm. of the reason for the hope that is in you and so what he, what does he mean by that he means you you it's perfectly fine to say i don't know but yeah. can i tell you about my experiences can i tell yeah. or once again hey let me you know like hey there's this other person that i think could help you or this you know, book or social media, but like, right. but just develop a fabric of a, in the, in your culture to where people don't recoil mm -hmm. at the notion that day one, everybody believes the same thing, that right. we are all as orthodox as orthodox can be. And, um, and yeah, and I think especially pastors and Christian leaders need, need to be, yeah, you don't have to be Tim Keller. I, I yeah. mean, but, but you just need to try and, in, yeah. and invest in, in whatever culture you're responsible for an idea that questions are, questions are not only okay, but they're good. They are an evidence of a real vibrant and growing faith. Now, how we answer the questions and how we treat them can lead us astray. Sometimes we all know, sure. That, right? sure. So, but yeah, but no, that's kind of what I see the church doing. And, and I'll be honest, Gen Z, I think is doing this well. Mm -hmm. Um, like the, the, the Gen Z leaders that we're seeing, like there's young guys in my church that like, like, you know, they blow me away with the time that they're willing to spend with, you know, high school students and just like help them wrestle with their faith. And so I think the Gen Z who we typically beat up on, I think that they're actually much more patient than us um, and, uh, and willing to say, yeah, this person's not there yet, but I'm, I really want to walk with them while they get there. And yeah. so, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of, I think the church is doing a, a better job than they get credit for sometimes on that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's a, it's a process, you know, like you said, Mm -hmm. I think we're getting better at it and it's becoming more popular. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's happening more and more. And so that's always a good thing. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for being here. It was great to have you on the podcast and I'm sure we'll stay connected social media and all the things we'll link it up. So anybody that wants to follow a tap can do that. Absolutely. Well, Kristen, thank you so much. And uh, what you and uh, Naeem and everybody at Mosaic are doing is really cool. Um, And uh, obviously, you know, you guys are good for Charlotte. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It's always so fun for me to get to meet and finally engage with people that I follow and admire and love learning from on social media. So listen, if there is anybody out there that you're following that you're like, man, I would love to hear more from this person on the Becoming Church podcast, reach out and let me know. Even if you don't know them personally, I have no shame about giving in anybody's DMs and I will ask anybody to come on and have a conversation if it's going to help us figure out how to become the church. So all of my social media handles are in the show notes. We will also link up Jeremy's. Thank you so much for being here, guys, and we'll see you next time.